You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an in-depth look at a variety of topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with experts on a variety of subjects and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this series. And I'm joined today by Dana Peterson, the chief economist of the conference board. Dana, welcome. Hi, Steve. It's always great to be here. And Dana, today we're talking about recession. You know, it looks like the world economy is slowing, that the US economy is sliding into recession. Lots going on, and you've just launched a new website hub to deal with this global slowdown and possible reception. Talk about that hub and the kind of information and insights that you're going to have there. Sure, absolutely, Steve. And this hub we're hoping will be an indispensable tool for our members to navigate through this next crisis. We've had so many different crises over the last few years. We had trade wars, we had the pandemic, which is still with us in many ways. And then we had the horrific war and the Ukraine breakout, then crippling inflation around the world. And now we're talking about a potential recession, certainly for the US, as you said, we have forecasted a recession, uh, the start sometime in the end of this year, and maybe extend into the early next year for China and Europe slowdowns. Um, but we have this hub that will hopefully be, uh, we can be a great ally to our members. And just a few highlights in the hub, when you enter the hub, when you enter this experience, you will see a knowledge center. So if you don't know what a recession means or how it's defined or what different central banks are doing, you can click on that knowledge center. We also have recession tracking in real time, looking at our indicators, our proprietary leading indicators that tell us when and if a recession is going to happen. And we have insights from across the conference board, from economic insights to insights about policy, marketing and communications, human capital and what it means for your labor forces, ESG, and also innovation and digital transformation. And every week we're hoping to update this hub with new content. There's plenty of content right now. There's about 55 different types of insights. We have charts, graphs, uh, webcasts, the whole bit. And we're also going to be sending out an email weekly to inform our members of what's new. Yeah, and and the public can access some of this through conferenceboard.org. And then our members should go there and, and log in to the MyTCB site to get even more uh, data and insights, right? Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about what is a recession. You know, you've talked about some of the foundational articles that are on there. How do you define a recession? You know, I'm here. I'm listening on the news to this great debate now of is it just two quarters of negative GDP, or is there more to it? It really depends on what country you're in. Uh, some countries do define a recession by two quarters of negative GDP growth, they might call that a technical recession or even an actual one. In the US, it's a little different. We actually abide by the guidance of the NBER, which is an organization that actually dates business cycle peaks and troughs. And so they have this, they're kind of the officials on whether or not there's a recession. And certainly for the US, it's really about how long, how deep and how wide. Uh, the weakness may be. And so you can have a recession that's just a few months. For example, a pandemic was a recession that was called for just a few months, but it was very deep. The GDP growth rates collapsed and also labor markets really deteriorated. And then in terms of how wide, how many industries are negatively affected and just about every industry was negatively affected during the pandemic. And so we had a recession that was a few months long, but very deep and very wide. Um, So again, it really depends on what your metrics are and what you're looking at in terms of which economy you're focused on with respect to recession. And NBER is made up of business economists and you're a member and you participate in this and they get together and evaluate it. So it's possible that we could have a couple of negative quarters, but because the job market is so strong and it's not that wide, as you say, 
it's possible that they could choose not to call that a recession, even if it, even if the num numbers are somewhat negative, right? Yes, that's true. And certainly that could be true for the first half of the of the year for the United States in particular. But what we're looking at is what could happen later on this year where we actually could see not only negative GDP growth rates, but also weakening in labor markets and income and all sorts of indicators. Yeah. And, you know, we've had tailwinds coming out of the recession. Of course, you, you mentioned that there was this very deep, short recession when we shut down the economy. Coming out of that, it was a great kind of uh, rejuvenation and, you know, a lot of tailwinds going on there. So now with the absence of those tailwinds, you know, once you remove that, that can sometimes feel like a headwind in and of itself. So it's, 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 there's a lot of psychology to this and slowing. And it, so how much does the consumer matter in all of this? Well, the consumer is very important all across the world because certainly consumers, uh, certainly in the US and Europe are huge portions of GDP growth. So consumer spending in the US has a share of about 65%. And then if you toss in uh, the residential sector, meaning housing, that's another 5%. So you're almost at 70% of the US economy is dependent upon consumer spending. And similar shares you can see for Europe, maybe around 50%. So if consumers aren't feeling that that the environment is good and that they want to go out and spend, then that's going to significantly affect the health of the economy. Yeah. And consumer confidence, therefore, is important. And it has been uh, declining here, but the jobs market is holding up. And so, you know, if the job market continues to be strong and, uh, and employment continues to be strong, you know, does, can we muscle through it? Well, yes, potentially. But again, when we look across the world and we're looking at indicators of, of business sentiment, our own measures of, of CEO confidence, and also our U.S. Consumer Confidence Index, they're all telling us that there's trouble ahead um, and that potentially there's going to be slowdowns not only in the U.S., but around the world. And a big chunk of that is due to inflation and also how central banks are responding to inflation. Prices are rising everywhere for goods, including food and energy, services, um, especially housing. And housing prices are rising not only in the U.S., but certainly across the world. And so with that, central banks are raising interest rates, and that slows down economies um, by reducing the amount of demand from consumers and also from businesses in terms of how much they decide to invest and how much labor they're going to de deploy. So... All of these things are kind of coalescing into something that's probably not going to be so pretty over the next six to 12 months. Well, and, you know, part of that is because these things just are not able to be dialed in. I mean, you spent an early part of your career, you spent time at the U.S. Federal Reserve. They don't have a big dial there that they just sort of, you know, create soft landings, right? I mean, they have a few tools and, you know, they do their best, but but interest rate hikes and a little quantitative tightening and you know it, that alone could could create a recession are they more concerned about re, you know a recession or inflation well the thing is that soft landings are rare but they can happen but the problem is that inflation is extremely high and so right now the fed is more concerned about inflation than inducing what might be a shallow or brief recession in the us that has ripple effects throughout the rest of the world. So I think that we're looking at inflation that's the highest we've seen in over 40 years, not only in the US, but in Europe, across emerging markets, and also the strength of the US dollar is making inflation even worse um, outside of the US. So with all that elevated inflation, which again, we haven't seen in decades, it makes sense that the Fed and other central banks are focused on tamping down inflation at the cost of, again, brief slowdowns. And potentially job losses. And so they've said, look, you know, we can't have this go. We'd rather we'd rather get inflation down below our target. And I think the targets, you know, have been publicly stated at around 2%. And so they would rather risk some of the other fallout in order to get that under control, I think. Is it the same outside the United States? 
Well, yes, uh, I think it's it's the same story. You're seeing, like I said, you're seeing rampant inflation all over the world. It's worse in emerging markets because they're much more sensitive to, sensitive to food and energy price shocks, which we're seeing as a consequence of the war in Ukraine. Um, but the, the, again, I think this is a little bit different in terms of labor markets in the U.S. as well as in Europe and even in, in parts of Asia like China and Japan is we're dealing with massive labor shortages. And that's because those regions I just mentioned are experiencing aging demographics. And so you have fewer and fewer people. So that means that potentially businesses may not have to let go of as many workers as say in prior recessions because they need those people and they've worked really hard over the last couple of years to gather and attract and retain employees. And so what we might see is, um, and uh, job vacancies are elevated all over the US and all over uh, Europe, that businesses will pull down those job ads first, um, but try to hold on to their workers. So we might not see a dramatic increase in unemployment rates around the world this time, but certainly it's it's definitely going to hurt the people who do find themselves unemployed. Yeah. So basically, there's so many job openings that you know you would think that they would um, they would eliminate the open positions if they needed to exactly uh, cut back. In which case, you wouldn't have the kind of impact that you've seen in past recessions. So, what could be the cause of recession in Europe? I, 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 you mentioned earlier that the re the regions are experiencing some of the same issues, but there, there are some differences as well. How about Europe? Sure. I think in Europe, there are two things that could potentially cause a recession. Number one, you could have worsening of the war in Ukraine. The humanitarian crisis is already horrific. Millions of people have been displaced, roughly 5 million Ukrainians. But you're also seeing these disruptions to production of, of key grains, uh, metals, fertilizers that are used to to grow crops also rare gases and rare earths all of these things are being negatively impacted by the war already but if the war worsens in the sense that russia expands its theater of conflict deeper into ukraine or even outside of ukraine to impact nato allied economies including the us then that's going to be much worse that's going to cause deeper uh, shortages, more supply chain interruptions, and even in the countries that are affected, potentially recessions because they are being they are the sort they are the the targets for aggression. Well, the second uh, issue is uh, Europe, along with the U.S., is facing very very elevated inflation. A lot of their inflation is actually linked to energy, in particular natural gas, um, because they are very heavily dependent upon natural gas from Russia. And Russia is being sanctioned um, and also cutting off supplies to Europe. And so those prices are rising very aggressively. And it's also feeding into core measures, meaning excluding food and energy. And so um, you could have people pulling back in consumption because of the rising food and energy prices. And also because the ECB has just started in raising interest rates. It's unlikely that the that its ECB is going to raise rates as high as the Fed will, but certainly higher interest rates puts more of, of the more indebted economies in Europe at risk of sovereign debt default. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier that some of the developing nations were, you know, more affected by the price increases on the, the low end kinds of products, food and energy, for example. And this is particularly true coming out of Ukraine where they're exporting grain, their normal exports are to uh, Africa and you know, some Middle Eastern and, and Asian countries that are developing nations. So it, it also depends not only whether the, the war broadens, but, but how long does, do these grain shortages happen? And then you know, the risk of potential, I guess, even starvation or, or famines in some of these uh, very poor countries, right? Indeed, we're concerned about the very real risk of famine, uh, but also with uh, political disruption. We're already seeing instances of rioting in the streets, regime changes, and all those things are very negative for economies. Um, the good news is that there are some economies that are well positioned to help support global grain production and exports. For example, the US and Canada and, and Western Europe and also India, interestingly, so 
there are some solutions here, but really we need an end to the war and end to the blockades of these grains going to these emerging markets that are quite vulnerable, both economically and politically. So we talked about US and Europe and you know that some of the ripple effects. The other big, huge player in this is China and their economy is different, of course, than the Western nations. Talk about what could cause a recession in China and some of the uniqueness to their economy. Sure, there are, I would say, three big issues for China right now. As you mentioned, China is different, where exports is a much larger share of their economy relative to consumption. And so if the U.S. is weakening, and the U.S. is a major trading partner, as well as Europe, especially Germany, if those two big regions are weakening, that means fewer exports for China, and China can slow materially from that external shock. The other two issues are more internal to China. So first of all, China has been having a major housing correction, and that's weighing on consumer confidence and also consumer spending. And indeed, consumer spending really didn't recover very well from the pandemic. And now you have this housing shock. And then the other issue is that the pandemic really isn't over for China. Indeed, China has this continued policy, uh, zero COVID policy, where if the number of infections rises, then there are shutdowns of activity. There's massive testing. People are forced to stay home from work. And that when that happens in large cities that are exposed to trade, that means that manufacturing ceases and so do exports. And so that's another risk of these repeated shutdowns. So combining all those three things, we have been downgrading our forecast for, for China and there could be future downgrades indeed if, if the US and Europe really experience bad bouts of economic downturn. We're talking about the potential of global slowdown and recession in certain regions. We're talking with Dana Peterson, the chief economist of the conference board. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board now predicts a U.S. recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation rate in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, the Conference Board continues its long-standing tradition of providing timely and relevant content on a daily basis to help guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side by visiting our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession, located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Dana Peterson, the Chief Economist of the Conference Board, and we're talking global slowdown and recession. So, Dana, we were talking before the break about U.S., then we talked about Europe, we talked about China, we talked a little bit about emerging markets as a spillover effect from, you know, uh, some of the issues in Ukraine. Any other emerging markets uh, issues that you see or you want to discuss? Absolutely. Emerging markets, it's, it's really a mixed picture. Um, most emerging markets are suffering from extremely elevated inflation, again, spillover from the war, but also because the U.S. dollar is appreciating rapidly. It's really outstanding, and certainly the U.S. dollar is appreciating because the Fed is addressing inflation. It seems almost counterintuitive, but because the Fed's raising interest rates and trying to bring down inflation, the response for financial markets is U.S. dollar strength. But that means massive depreciation for every other economy, and certainly emerging markets are much more vulnerable to the uh, to importing inflation through their currencies, and that's also feeding through to and consequently causing their central banks to raise interest rates. So we're seeing that happen. <laughs> but then there are some emerging markets that have that produce commodities, uh, such as the Gulf, where they are actually doing better and they're experiencing faster GDP growth. And also they're engaging in more investment in areas that are not 
uh, related to oil because of the massive oil windfall to amid the elevated prices. But for the merging, for the most part, but even 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 in those economies, they are seeing prices rise. So it's kind of a bittersweet moment for them. But emerging markets are also being affected by these global forces impacting upon them. Yeah, you know, I think sitting here in the U.S., you, you tend to think about the impact of the U.S. dollar, the impact of fiscal spending and inflation and all of that on the U.S. You don't tend to think about then the ripple effect throughout the globe of the dollar the, and, the, and inflation and, as you say, how it's imported and exported. And, you know, if we're going to be a good global citizen, we really do need to caretake the U.S. economy and the dollar and all. We have to take care of all these things because it impacts so many people around the world. Indeed. Yeah. So what do you hear from CEOs? You know, we did the we do the the CEO confidence survey. You're talking to CEOs every day. What are they saying about the state of the, the economies? It's great. We actually have CEO confidence surveys for the United States, Europe, and China. And all three are pretty consistent in terms of CEOs believing that there's trouble ahead. Most of them are expecting that there will be some kind of downturn, economic downturn or recession in their respective regions. They're also very much concerned about the war in Ukraine and the implications for business over the next 12 months. And indeed, many of them expect that there will be continued volatility in energy prices, higher costs for inputs, uh, and also concerns about cybersecurity. And in response, many of them are focusing on diversifying their supply chains. They're also looking at updating their risk management programs as well as their crisis management programs. Yeah. Now, you know, as a former CEO, when things start slowing down, you know, you sort of pull back on, you know, discretionary spending and so forth. Are you hearing CEOs say that they're going to do that? Well, the interesting thing is that uh, they're still, at least in the U.S., they're still looking to hire, <laughs> again, because they have these ongoing labor shortages. They're still looking to raise wages to both keep and attract people. Again, some of that might slow as we head into a downturn in the U.S., but businesses are also pretty forward-looking. And what they're doing, and this is what we found from our mid-year C outlook survey, is that they are engaging in digital transformation. They are developing new lines of business. They're upskilling and retaining their talent. And some of them are even engaging in automation. So a lot of technology and human development, as well as looking to new areas to expand their reach. But th so does that mean that labor productivity could actually increase here during this period of time? Well, I mean, we've seen a lot of gyrations in productivity. Certainly in 2021, productivity shot up uh, because you had productivity is basically output divided by the number of hours. And we saw this massive surge in activity in GDP as, as, as the global economy recovered from the pandemic. And so your, num your denom numerator was really strong and your denominator didn't really need to do anything. But then this year we're seeing the reverse. Um, so what's going to happen going forward? Well, we think that uh, investments now in digital transformation, automation, technology, also in infrastructure and R&D will be helpful for increasing productivity over the next 10 years. Um, but again, there are many headwinds. Indeed, one of the biggest headwinds right now is inflation. It's difficult to invest if you're a business, if everything costs so much. Um, and also, if you don't have the right types of investments from capital markets, but nonetheless, we're constructive on productivity going forward. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're a CEO and you do what you were saying earlier in the program, which is you start to eliminate open positions, you basically are trying to grow and do more with fewer people that also contributes to labor productivity, not in the way that you, you know, that you'd ideally like, but more, you know, people just have to do more in order to get through things. But, you know, you also have uh, the cost of capital going up at the same time. Do you hear anything on capital investment plans? Well, certainly in the U.S. capital and also abroad, capital investment plans still main, remain pretty positive as of our second quarter surveys. Uh, we're going to have another survey in the third quarter for uh, the U.S. and then in the fall, we're going to have surveys for China and Europe. But the interesting thing, just going back to labor, is that 
many businesses do value their labor uh, and what they're doing is they're the number one thing that they're doing in order to attract and keep people and make sure that people are productive when they're working is promoting their hybrid hybrid work model. And we've said many times that remote work is probably here to stay in some form or fashion, uh, but most likely in a hybrid form. Um, many businesses are also moving very quickly on automation. <laughs> so bringing in the robots. So that's that's going to make up for any losses that they may have in terms of, of people. Uh, but they're also improving their efficiency when it comes to recruiting. And so they're hiring recruiters to make sure they get the right people so that, such that those people will be uh, productive. And certainly you can marry human capital with technology, and that comes from training. Many businesses are upskilling their workers to make sure that they can take advantage of the new technology that's being brought in. Yeah, the, you know, the whole hybrid work thing um, is interesting, but it doesn't apply universally. I mean, you can't build a, a, a house or build, you know, do construction work virtually. A lot of services you cannot do virtually. Um, and, and hence your, your point on bring in the robots, you know, bring in more automation uh, as much as possible to the service industry. And you see that in restaurants, for example, where people are ordering off of tablets and, you know, they're cutting back on, you know, the high touch uh, aspect of it. But, you know, how far can, it, how far can the hybrid work go uh, in terms of labor productivity before, you know, you just run against, you know, structural walls? Well, you're absolutely right in terms of hybrid work not working everywhere, and certainly it does not work in in-person services, but those are also the businesses that are experiencing the biggest labor shortages and have the most number of vacant positions open. And so a lot of the automation that's taking place is because they can't find workers. Not so much that they don't want these workers. So if you can't find someone to come into the restaurant and wait on tables, you get a laptop or one of those QR codes and the guests have to kind of do it themselves. So a lot of the automation is really in response to labor shortages. So I think that certainly there are there are limits and ultimately you do need people. Even if you deploy technology, you need people to make sure that the technology continues to work and that it upgrades. And you still have to make sure that your existing workers are adapting to that new technology. Otherwise technology is absolutely useless. Yeah. And so, you know, Dana, it, we barely scratched the surface on the insights that you are developing to help our members and, and companies around the world uh, adapt and change and, you know, deal with what's coming ahead. You know, describe uh, a little bit more about the range of the work that's going to be on this hub and, uh, again, remind people how they can find it. Sure, absolutely. So if you go onto the conference board's main homepage, so just type in Google or wherever you search uh, the conference board, you will see that we have this wonderful carousel. And in the carousel, there is an image there advertising our hub. And so it's very easy to find. You can also type in global recession into Google and our hub will pop up. And so it's very easy for you to find. It's also quite easy to navigate. Already with the launch, we have over 50 pieces of content, which again, include webcasts, podcasts, written works, um, we have these blurbs of information that provides a really a, a great overview of what the underlying content looks like. And that's all visible to the public. But certainly if you want deeper insights, it's great to become a member so that you can have access to everything that we have to offer. And the range of information and insights covers economy, the strategy, finance, human capital, marketing communications, public policy, uh, the China Center, the Gulf Center, uh, also insights in Europe and Asia and the, and the multiple regions. So uh, whether you're a local firm or a multinational, uh, whether you're in HR and trying to deal with human capital issues or uh, strategic and financial issues, you've got it covered. Absolutely, yes, we do. Dana Peterson, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Steve. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by an expert discussing the issues and the insights of our time. We'll cover topics ranging from the economy and geopolitics to human capital, to uh, marketing communications and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues. I know that everybody is gonna wanna hear about the insights from the conference board.
I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation for over 100 years. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side. Just visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, your indispensable guide through the global recession, located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.